Welcome to episode 51 of Published. Today I'll speak with author and book coach Jenny Nash. This will be the first part of a two-episode special where we dive into the art of creating a successful book proposal. Jenny will share what it takes to craft a compelling proposal and offer advice for authors embarking on this process. Welcome to Published, a podcast by Greenleaf Book Group, where we'll discuss the ins and outs of the publishing industry, from writing a book and finding the right publisher, to gearing up for a book launch. And now, here's your host, Greenleaf Book Group CEO, Tanya Hall. Welcome back to Published. In this episode, we'll discuss the different parts that make up a book proposal and why they are an important part of the book publishing and querying process. In this first episode, Jenny goes into detail about the important differences between an outline and an annotated table of contents and advises us on the biggest issues authors face when constructing their proposals. Here's the interview. Well, Jenny, welcome to Published. It's so great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here and on video. Yes, for the first time. Well, could you start off by telling us a little bit about your background and what you do? Sure. So I'm a book coach and a lot of people have never heard that term. Um, Everybody knows what an editor is. An editor comes in and works on a piece of writing when it's finished to make it better. And what a book coach does is works with the writer while they're writing. So it's over time and optimizing what you're doing while you're doing it, much like a basketball coach would or a singing coach or, you know, another executive coach. And I have my own private clients. I specialize in helping people with nonfiction book proposals. And I also run a book coach training company called Author Accelerator, where I train and certify people to do this work as well. And I came to be a book coach through a long and winding journey through publishing. I've actually been in publishing in the industry for more than 30 years. My first job out of college was at Random House. And I've done all kinds of things in all kinds of ways in the realm of publishing for this entire time, including writing 10 books and teaching for 12 years at the UCLA writing program. So I've done all kinds of things and and landed here as, as a book coach at this phase of my career. Awesome, that is some impressive pedigree you have. (laughs) So I think um, as a baseline perhaps, why don't we help our listeners understand the goal of a book proposal and why that's such an important part of querying an agent? Yeah, so uh, traditionally a book proposal is used to get a traditional publisher. So the way to do that is to pitch to an agent and then to have the agent pitch to a traditional publisher. And the book proposal is, I often describe it as a business plan. It's a a holistic pitch or a a plan for how the whole book is gonna function and look and feel. So it's a, a document that you use to pitch to agents. That's typically how we think of it. But more and more, it's also a document that writers are using to understand their idea no matter what direction they're going to publish, whether they're going to go with a hybrid, maybe they're going to even self-publish, but it's a way for them to wrap their minds around the idea, really pin it to the page, really make sure they understand the, the business case for that book. So it's, a, it's not just a simple table of contents. It's really an argument for why this book needs to be in this world, why you're the best person to write it, how it's going to, to function. So it's, they're really fun to work on because they're, um, they touch on so many aspects of book writing and the, the experts thought process. And they're just, uh, they're just a lot of fun to get that 3D picture of what this book is going to be in the world. Yeah, I can see where that's probably a pretty exhaustive discovery process for an author. It is. It is. And one thing that I should say about it before we dig into them is that in in on the nonfiction side, books are often sold on proposal alone. So some people don't realize that, that you can take a proposal get an agent, have that agent pitch a publisher and get a book deal before the book is completely written. And that is quite typical in on the nonfiction side. And 
on the, if you're going to a, a hybrid publisher, if you have a book proposal, it just means you're further down the road of, of producing that book and getting it ready for publication. So it's, it's an excellent step to take no matter what tool you're going to use to publish or what path you're going to take to publishing. It's, it's a first step in really defining what this book is going to be and putting a stake in the ground for it. Mm -hmm, definitely. So why don't we break down the essential elements of the book proposal, the key sections that have to be there, and then how long they should be. I think you and I probably have both seen proposals that are really, really, really long or others that um, really don't serve any purpose because they're so short. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, some people are, are surprised at how long a book proposal tends to be. And I can, so I can talk about the sections and and about the reason why they might be long. And so my clients' proposals typically fall somewhere in the range of 45 to 90 pages. And the, the reason that they might differ has to do with the length of the sample chapters, really. Mm -hmm. So the uh, typical proposal has eight sections. And those sections are there's an overview, which is what it sounds like. It's a, just a summary description of what this book is, what this project is, how it's going to be. You might think of it like an extended book jacket copy, the, the words on the back of the book, but it's, it's meatier in a book proposal and it serves a couple more functions than, than the book jacket, but it's, it's similar. The, um, Manuscript specifications is just a very simple few lines about what this book is going to look like, how long it's going to be, are there going to be illustrations or um, other elements in it, and usually a description of when the author believes that book can be finished. So, you know, you might say in manuscript specific specifications, you might say this book will be complete on January 1st. Um, so it's just a super short section. There's always an author bio and photo, and this is not just a resume. This is really an argument for why this writer is the best person to write this book. So it's crafted in a way that, like all parts of the book proposal, that go toward selling this project and, and defining this project and what is in the author's background that makes them the right person to write this book. And that those credentials could be could be anything you know you could um you could be a dentist who has perfected some sort of process or system that you want to um write about and your your expertise comes from your being the person that developed that or you could be a, a scholar who's done research or somebody who's lived an experience and um the author bio really wants to get at that why why you um, they're typically not that long, maybe a page um, or a little bit more. The audience analysis section of a book proposal is where we're really segmenting the audience and defining exactly who it is. And it, most people dismiss this part of the proposal, but it's one of the most important parts because we're really trying to circle around who the primary buyer of this book might be and also who the other secondary audiences might be. And it's really starting to look at why does this book need to exist? What, you know, what is the solution that it is providing somebody, some group of people who have some sort of problem? And their problem could be they want to learn something or they don't know something or they're seeking expertise or knowledge or, you know, really defining what their, what their pain is, what their problem is, and then how, um, you know, how you're going to solve it will come later, but just really who these people are. And a good proposal is going to provide some very uh, serious data and statistics on that audience and, and a way for us to, to know how big that audience is and how primed they are to, to be buying books. Um, so that section is, takes a lot of research and digging and thinking and tinkering and, and figuring in all elements of the book proposal, it's a very iterative process. So they ping against each other, the, the different sections where you're working on one and then you go back to refine the other and then you use that information and it's, they're kind of um, constantly changing and growing as you develop them together. The 
section, uh, the next section is the comp title section. So people call this comparative titles or competitive titles. There's different ways of framing it, but it's basically the context into which your book is going to be born. What, where is it going to sit on the shelf? What other books are going to be sitting on that shelf with it? And the way that I like to describe this for my writers is um, I like to say that the books are having a conversation. The books that are already published and out in the world are having a conversation. And one book is saying one thing and the other book is saying yes, and also this. And another book is saying, well, no, but then there's this. And another book is saying, you're all wrong, there's this. And that conversation is, is what you wanna be jumping into. So the comp titles are defining the the conversation that, that you want to be part of and what books are already having that. And, and, you know, another way to think about it is the, the books that might be stacked on your ideal readers nightstand. And, you know, the thing that's amazing about books is that when, when people want a book, they usually want all the books. <laughs> you know? the, people don't usually buy one book about having a baby or one book about starting a business. Or, you know, one oh book God. about learning how to write a book. They, they usually buy dozens, which we want. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> I mine. <laughs> I know we're going to circle back to all these things, but I'll keep going on the sections of the, of the book proposal. The, the next section is the marketing plan. And this is different from a launch plan. So a launch plan for a book are what are the tactics that I'm going to use when I, when I bring my book out? What am I going to, um, you know, am I going to have a party? Am I going to have a, go on a book tour? Um, a, a marketing plan is really about how are you going to connect with those ideal readers that you identified? What are you going to do in the world to get that book into those readers' hands? And it really is the job of the author in this publishing climate to, to know how to do that and to define how that's going to be done. In a perfect world, your publisher is going to be a strong and lively partner in that, um, but some more than others. So it's really up to the, the writer to think about this, define this, dig deep into this. And this is a part of the book proposal where most people don't understand their own power and don't understand their own potential. And there's so much that you can do and that you should do and, and that you want to know about doing that goes into that marketing plan. And you can see what I said before about the iterative process that if somebody is working on their marketing plan, they may actually begin to tweak who their audience is. And they may go back to that audience section and add a whole category of who they're speaking to. Or they may then go into the comp titles and say, well, wait a second, my book's really leaning more towards this than that other. Let me go back and, and define those titles better. So um, that marketing plan is, is a really robust part of the process. The core of the proposal is the annotated table of contents. Um, by annotated, what we mean is well, for each section or chapter of the book, you're really describing what is going to be in, in that book. And the, you know, when I said before that nonfiction books are often sold on proposal, that sounds like such a, um, <laughs> such a boondoggle, but the, the, the dark side of that is that working on a book proposal is doing all the hard work of writing a book at one time. It's concentrating all the hard work into this one document. And the annotated table of contents is really where the, um, the rubber meets the road. Whatever this book is going to be is, is all going to be defined in this annotated table of contents. It's not just a vague, well, this is sort of kind of what I'm gonna do. It's really, this is how the whole thing drives together and, and promises a transformation for the reader. So the, the annotated table of contents is, um, takes a lot of digging and, and iterating and editing. And I spoke before about that back and forth nature of the development of the proposal. And you can see how when you really get into the annotated table of contents, you might, you might find yourself speaking 
speaking more and more to one audience than another or leaning more heavily into one type of, of information than another and that might really change all the other elements of the proposal. So the annotated um, table of contents is um, hard work and it's, and it's meaty. Sometimes depending on the book, these parts of the proposal can be six, seven, eight pages long um, where you're really digging into this content. And then the final section of the proposal are sample chapters. And these are chapters that you, you write and polish to show that you can pull off what you promise and to, to really prove that you can write this content that you've described and to, to give that um, to the, the person that you're pitching, pitching this to, or to your own self to really define what the voice of this book is going to be and the tone of, of what this is going to be. So those are the elements of the proposal. And in terms of how, how long they are, you can write a really excellent proposal that is on the short side. But to your point, I get a lot of referrals from agents where agents will get a writer who comes in and, and maybe they have a great idea and maybe they have a big following and their idea of the book proposal that they pitched to the agent was a four page brainstorm about their idea with a one page table of contents kind of scratched out. And they're, they're often very surprised at how robust and fleshed out a, a real proposal is going to be. So you can have a really excellent short proposal, but it's not going to be that short if you do if you do all of the elements correctly it's it's got to be in that you know if you think about a typical chapter let's say is 12 pages so two sample chapters is going to be 24 pages you know that's that's just a start and then all the other elements that's why i say that the typical range for my clients starts at about 40 and um much more than about 90 then it's sort of like why are these chapters so long <laughs> I want to circle back to the annotated table of contents. Would you say that that is similar to an outline? I think a lot of people are maybe more acquainted with the concept of an outline when they think about starting a book. Yes, except that the reason that it's called that is an outline. Most of us think about what we were taught in school, which is sort of there's the A level, then there's the sub A level, and then there's the, you know, next level. Um, it's very um, linear. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's very kind of flat. And um, the the annotated table of contents, it is an outline. That is technically what it is, but it's um, just meatier than that. It's more robust than that. It's really it's really getting into, I mean, I can give you an example. I was, I was working with a client who's an executive leadership coach and he's working on a book about networking, really high level networking. And his annotated table of contents, each chapter of his, his book describes a different skill or element that you need to be a master networker. And each chapter featured a case study from a particular one of his clients. So the annotated table of contents would talk about this skill or this concept that he would be teaching, why it was important, what people typically get wrong about it. Then it would describe the person, the case study he was going to feature, why he chose this person, who that person was, what the journey that that person went on to learn or master this skill, and then the chapters were going to be rounded out by um, exercises to build that skill. So the annotated table of contents, when I said the hard work of writing a book happens there, because we had to really decide, okay, which skills are you going to feature? How many are you going to feature? Are those skills actually going to be part of the concept of the book? You know, is it 12 skills to master or is it, um, you know, some other way of looking at that material. And, and then who are you going to feature in that chapter? And the reason deciding matters so much is that in this particular case, the author was debating 
about who his primary audience was. And one version of his primary audience was uh, people of color. And he himself um, is a person of color. So he was debating, should this book be primarily targeted toward that audience? And if so, that's going to obviously change who I feature and, and how I feature them and what I talk about. So while we were working on that content that was going to be in, the, in the, this annotated table of contents and ch choosing those stories, it really launched us into a debate about the audience and what that audience was going, going to be. So that's why I say that it's the hard work of actually writing the book. And the genius thing about a book proposal is that when you've got it done and right, writing the book becomes a piece of cake because you have a, a roadmap. You don't, you're separating out the hard work of figuring out what goes in a book from the hard work of writing that book. And most people glom those two things together. And that's why it's so hard and why they get so stuck is because they're trying to figure out what to say and how it fits into the whole at the same time as they're actually trying to write it. So the the hard work of of doing that annotated table of contents is it's much more than just well here's an outline of of the ideas that are going to be in this book it's it's meaty and robust and it's i agree with you it's the heavy lifting of getting the process going in writing the book and i tell people my own story when i wrote my book ideas influence and income i worked with my own team here at greenleaf and <laughs> The on-staff editor, uh, bless his heart, I very arrogantly was like, I don't need an outline. I teach on this stuff all the time. <laughs> and he said, okay, Tanya. And he waltzed off and left me to do my writing. And I stubbornly tried to plow through it without an outline for some time. And then I came back to him eating crow. <laughs> I was like, I don't, the problem is I know so much other stuff that I keep losing sight of my reader and the fact that they don't care about the distribution supply chain in which, you know, my background is so heavily in distribution and, and I have to remember who this is for and they pay people to deal with that stress. So <laughs> finally went back and did the outline and it took me some time. You're right. It was a lot of um, just staying true to who I had already defined was my audience and thinking about what do they really, really essentially need to know what's going to help this process be their best experience possible. And then, like you said, writing it was a piece of cake. It was just referring to uh, the sections I hadn't finished yet. <laughs> well, Tanya, I love, I love that you brought this up because I've been fascinated in my career of working with, you know, I'm always working with people who are experts in whatever their area is. And I'm fascinated that it is not just a simple transposing of, of one thing to another. So you talked about, you teach on this all the time. It should be easy to, to write a book. I work with people who give keynotes and, and they think, well, all I have to do is kind of just give my keynote. Whatever their active participation in their area of expertise is, it doesn't translate directly to a book. And I, I'm just fascinated by that because a, you know, I've thought a lot about it and a book is a different beast. It is different from being in a room, giving a talk or being in a room, teaching a course. And it, it sometimes does take more work than people think it's going to. And once they realize that the process goes much smoother, but that what you experienced, I do see a lot where people think, I got this. It's going to take me, you know, a week and I'll just slap it out and I'll have it down. And, and it almost never works like that. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> okay. So we've established that there is a lot of work to be done in getting this book proposal over the finish line. What are some of the key issues that you see authors run into in the proposal drafting process? Um, that is such a good question. I think one of the biggest is the, the temptation to put too much in it, to put everything they know in it. And we forget when we're experts on something that we're experts on, on, we know so much. It's that burden of knowledge. We know so much. And to define the edges of that idea or the, 
the what you're going to where you're going to enter and where you're going to exit in terms of the the transformation you're taking your reader through and to realize that you can't share everything you know and that you can't put it all put it all in there i think that's one of the biggest pitfalls is um it's like the fire hose <laughs> the fire hose problem of let me just you know blast people away with everything that i know about this topic i, th I think that's um that's one thing that i that i see a lot and and then another thing that i see a lot is this idea of uh perfection um perfectionism because of a book there is a sense that a book lives forever it it's going to sit there on the shelf and it's going to speak for you it's going to define who you are in the world for a long time to come you can't unlike a, a course where you can teach it better the next time or a keynote where you probably optimize and get better every every time and there's days where you really knock it out of the park and and days you know where you're a little flat and and it all evens out with a book, it's people know, writers know it's it's done, it's it, that's that's it. And it it's that can be hard for people to to let go of. Um, and so there's there's a lot of procrastination and and perfectionism and worry about that. And you know, there comes a time where you have to call it and let it go. And there's there's stages in publishing of letting go, you know, so having, um, coming upon those deadlines and, and reckoning with them and, and dealing with that is, I think, something people struggle with too. Was, was that something you felt or were you? Mm. I felt all of those things. Yes. <laughs> I think, um, I have an advantage over most authors because I already know and trust my team, right? They, they're the people who work here. So that was not so much an issue. And, um, they will tell you I was probably better at most authors at just quickly approving things, <laughs> partly because I was so late getting my manuscript in, like many authors. Um, yes, there's, I mentioned earlier, I really struggled to put rails around the content and really keep it confined to what I thought would best serve the reader. Uh, because sometimes those very things were things that I did indeed teach on in a different uh, environment or under a different need. So yeah, it, it takes a lot of uh, kind of stepping outside of yourself. And yeah. And thinking about how that book is going to function. Um, I mean, the, there's another thing people struggle with that is, that is my favorite part of the process, which is just structuring that material. What is the best shape or structure or design for this material? What is the, the best way to convey it or for it to, to live in the world? And the the reason i say it's my favorite part is that somebody can come in with the most incredible material and they they may be really good at what they do and and have this wealth of knowledge but packaging in such a way or shaping it or structuring it in such a way that it really can hit the reader is is what we're after and there there are so many examples i mean my favorite example is simon sinek start with why which is just such a mega best selling book and the thing that i love to talk about is is he described that anybody who's read the book knows he's got this golden circle idea with why at the center and then i think it's how and what the concentric circles so it's this super simple idea of this target with Y at the center and you know he calls it the golden circle and and then everybody knows about the golden circle and he talks about the golden circle and you know what that golden circle is is just a structure that he made and designed to contain this idea or to convey this material in a way that we're all going to remember and talk about and spread you know that's what we want is for our ideas to have an impact and sometimes just how you design or shape or structure them is the thing that's going to have them make an impact and something as simple as well we'll make this golden circle and then that will be you know what people remember and here i am sitting here rattling that off you know i probably read that book 10 years ago but i've been talking about that golden circle for the you know a really long time so it sometimes it's um that's another thing 
that writers struggle with is, okay, here's your information. It's really good information. There's not one thing wrong with this information, but the way that it's being packaged or put together or designed or structured in this book is, is just falling a little flat. And it, you know, it sounds like every other book. Um, you know, an example of that is I have somebody coming to me right now who has some really interesting ideas about mindfulness um, and, and meditation for business people. I mean, there's gazillions of books about mindfulness and meditation. So what is she going to do to define her audience, define this idea, shape or structure it, figure it out so that it it's memorable, it stands out, it gets passed around, people get talked about, it gets attention. And what can she do? What does she know? What does, how can it be different? And that that's another thing that, you know, so we talked about defining the boundaries of the idea. We talked about ending, ending the writing and making sure you actually get the book done and, and don't hold on to it forever. And then there's that big middle section of just how, how is this material going to be shaped? Um, that's hard. It is hard. I will say one of my favorite resources, you talked about um, that golden circle and the book Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers. Which oh, is so good. Quite old, yes. And I remind people of it all the time. They're like, oh, I forgot about that book. I read it 10 years ago. It, I revisit it all the time because there are fantastic ideas in there and concepts about how to develop um, not just a book, but a message, frankly, that leaves an impression with an audience. So that's a good resource too. I love that book. There's another one too um, called Contagious and I'm blanking on the author's name. Um, but it's, I know it's called contagious, but yeah, it, that I love made to stick and, and you're right. It, it's the same thing. Even just the cover of that book I can picture, which was some duct tape. Um, yep. and <laughs> yeah, right. And just, that's the kind of thing that that title, the way that the cover was designed, the way the material was designed, the idea that so many people need their or want their idea to stick that those are all decisions that those authors made within, and you know, they probably did it in a proposal to, to work that all out. And that, that's why it's so fun is how do you, how do you take good content and make it great? That's it for our episode today with Jenny Nash. We hoped you enjoyed learning about how to create a successful book proposal. Be sure to tune in to next month's episode for part two of this interview. For notes and resources from today's show, go to greenleafbookgroup.com slash episode 51. You can also find advice for writing, publishing, and promoting your work in my book, Ideas, Influence, and Income, which you can learn more about at ideasinfluenceandincome.com. If you've enjoyed our show, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. It means a lot to have your feedback and definitely helps us make sure we're answering your publishing questions. A big thank you to Eleanor Fishborn, who produces the published podcast. We'll be back next month with another new episode. Thanks for listening to Published. To learn more, please visit greenleafbookgroup.com. And remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes.